Cheers. Great. Well, hello, everyone. We're back with another episode of Zeke from Home, and I'm very pleased to have Ashish Sharma with us today. Um, I can't remember exactly when I first met Ashish. She was probably at one of the one of the old bro workshops or something like that. But um, I have to I have to say, Ashish, you you have never failed to deliver in any talk. Uh, I think everyone will always remember seeing you speak, and uh, you've got the, probably one of the best senses of humor in security. Period. So uh, I always look forward to hearing what you, what you want to share with with anyone. So thank you for agreeing to be part of the webinar today. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, uh, I, I, I will not forget when I first met you. It was actually in 2005 at Usenix conference. Oh, Usenix. Uh, okay. I, wow. I, I sat through your uh, uh, like free conference tutorials and uh, and had uh, lunch with you actually so <laughs> oh so that's a long time yeah so we, uh, i used to do start the... my talk uh... yeah yeah okay cool sure Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, so, uh, like, uh, I was a little surprised that there was a little interest in this particular talk. This is a recycled talk. I generally don't prefer giving my previous talks again. Uh, but uh, again, given that this is one of those elementary like beginner's talk, uh, I think it's definitely useful to share with uh, all the people, especially like people who are joining the community uh, in recently. So the idea on this talk was, I think back in 2018, I gave this one, and this is a little more updated now, uh, but the idea was that, you know, it, uh, let, uh, let's talk about simple stuff in Zeek, like get people uh, an orientation about where we are, how, what are the capabilities of scripting, uh, how do you actually approach writing heuristics and detection. And, uh, and then it's like, okay, it's going to go from 101 to 595 in 45 minutes. Trust me, like I can't even uh, cross 200 actually, given this. I come from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, uh, it's a pretty awesome place to work at. Uh, uh, we are up on the hill right next to UC Berkeley campus. Uh, uh, the name to the fame for lab has been Nobel Prizes and whatnot. Uh, but uh, I think for me, it's more like Cuckoo's Egg was pretty much a story which happened at the lab. Oh, then yeah. uh, network utilities like this trace route, Lippy Cap, and uh, more so like Z came from LBNL. So in this talk, actually, uh, is my attempt to actually give a just a beginner's overview like okay how do you even start into zeek scripting and uh, i know like different people run different ways i have a very different way of learning things uh, most of the time mine is actually like uh, write something break it and then try to figure out what happened uh, and then uh, there is a lot of literature available online. A part of the talk actually shows pointers to where things are, what to do, where to look for. And uh, uh, here, basically, I wanted to, to just cover like from the very scratch, like, okay, what are the functionalities? How do we use it? How do we even think about those things? So like any programming language, uh, Zeek script actually starts with hello world. And here is this thing, like you can, literally do an event Zeek in it, and then it's a hello world. But uh, I am not quite sure how many people actually are aware of try.zeek.org. Uh, if you are not, uh, I would say uh, you should definitely check it out, try.zeek.org. And if you are aware of it, I, th I would say use it more often. This is, this is a really good uh, uh, platform to actually test out scripts, share them, or even like if you have issues, put something here and then you can actually easily uh, collaborate with other uh, folks to debug. Uh, so this is a simple example of like hello world in on try.zeek.org. Uh, 
uh, and then when you run it, you can actually get the output too. And like if you go further down, it actually gives you all the logs and everything as well. And what this allows you is also to upload PCAPs if you want to run your heuristics on a specific PCAP and also lets you choose different versions of Zeek or Bro. So, but another way to run it is actually use your desktop laptop. So like uh, on this yellow part of the screen, uh, I do have a, uh, like I call Zeek with this particular script and it actually did it. So you, you can install it. I generally tell people to install Zeek on their desktop or laptop and then keep running it and then go and look at the logs. When you do, you already kind of remember like, oh yeah, 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 I was on this website, I was doing, uh, uh, using this software. And then when you look at the logs, you can easily understand what you were up to. And that basically gets you a picture uh, of like how to interpret logs. Then eventually when you're looking at the logs of your organization, looking at the logs, you can actually see like what this particular user might be up to. But, uh, Again, pride.zeek.org, there is a whole lot of literature documentation available out, uh, on this. Uh, definitely should check it out or use more often otherwise. So then there is a bunch of uh, literature available uh, and including like uh, Zeek manual. I think uh, uh, like uh, I, I'm pretty astonished that Richard is right here because like the way I actually first started understanding a bunch of things in what used to be bro that time was uh, Richard's writing as well as his book. And then uh, like uh, in fact, uh, Usenix stuff too. So, but, uh, and that time there was not much documentation. Like there wasn't quite a manual available either, but now there is a pretty good manual. There is a good Slack channel, so on and so forth. So here is the thing which actually makes Zeek uh, slightly unique than other programming languages in some ways. So like, the, like all other languages, there is Boolean, count, integer, double, then there's time and interval data types, there is a string, but then uh, there is this concept of network types too, where there is a port, there's an address, there is a subnet. And these are pretty powerful uh, entities in the Zeek scripting world. Uh, what this allows you is like basically you can really define things in the network layer. And then there are container types like tables, set, vectors, and records. And these are extremely powerful data structures. Uh, I have used or abused them quite a bit. Like sometimes my tables actually grow to a million, two million elements too. And they have their own uh, uh, implications, but these are very, very strong. Uh, 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 container type data structures, which will help you. And then if you're writing script, then you should definitely be familiar with uh, functions, events, and hooks. So, and this is actually pretty much available. Like all this, the descriptions for this are available on the Zeek manual. So then there are variables. So there are variables which are of global in nature, local in nature, uh, pretty much almost similar to how your C or Python uh, variable scopes are. And then there are namespace modules. So like, for example, if you're writing something, uh, which is your own very specific uh, heuristic, you can actually create a module and uh, have your own namespace. Then you don't have like fights on the variable names or constraints or anything like that. And one of the very powerful uh, feature of Zeek is also being able to redefine variables too. So you, so if you declare a variable with a redefined attribute, like for example here, default capture password is f, but false, uh, but it's redefinable. So if you redefine it, then you can actually uh, add values to it, change it uh, on fly too. So again, here is the link for where these uh, container uh, types or data structures or the, like, how do you learn more about these things? But how are these used actually in Bird? So for example, port, so you can define like, the, here is a SSS port. Uh, I have something called like watch destination ports, which is a set of port. And then you start what put all the ports which you want to watch into. Or for example, subnet. So we have defined like, okay, here is our VPN subnet. Here is our name server subnet. Here is our mail ser server subnet. So you can actually kind of define all that. Uh, I have used pattern quite a bit. Uh, now it's not as powerful, no, as useful in some ways because of the increase in encryption. 
but this like uh, URI matching was really awesome where like miscreants would actually download something over HTTP and it's like, oh yeah, here is an exploit. Here is another exploit. Here is a root shell. So you can actually create all these regular expressions and really, really strong uh, and complex regular expressions, uh, which you can actually ma match against. Uh, there's addresses, there's times, so all this stuff. But, uh, uh, and then uh, here is this rediff directive where you can actually say, you know what, uh, I have a watch destination port, but it's a rediff. So you can actually expand on it uh, in line over time while things are running. And actually, uh, I think now uh, the next thing which has come up is actually configuration framework. So you don't even have to worry about this as much more. You can create an option variable and then you can use configuration framework and basically add things to a file which would get updated inside Zeek. So, but here are certain mistakes I would always, well, not always, but yeah, more often than I would like to would make. For example, here is a rediff watch destination set port. So I defined 88, 8000, 55, 55. And then I actually went and defined 22 TCP as well. But here is a disaster. Uh, if you look at it, I said, okay, equals to 22 TCP, which basically means it literally overrode all the previous uh, things which were actually in this particular uh, variable. So you should always remember to do a plus equals to or a minus equals to if you want to remove. Otherwise, if you just do an equal and then assign a value to this variable, it would actually forget everything else which it had in the past and that can have serious consequences. Uh, same thing here, like you have a VPN subnet uh, and uh, actually this is not even right. Like I think this example is this is a set and I'm, I cannot add to a set like this, but either way, here's VPN subnet. So you have a set of subnet and then you can actually go further. Same thing is here. Uh, so always make sure that you don't actually just assign with an equal, always use a plus equals to if you are redefine, uh, appending a redefinable variable. So here is a pattern. So uh, like previously I would watch for things like, okay, uh, here is this thing, a string which I found out. Now I'm gonna watch for all the URLs in an email and see if there is a match on this. Sometimes you would find exploits, other times you would find malware, you like all, but this is pretty much a regular expression match or a signature match. But then there are all these things like, okay, I have a use case. Uh, I like to extract all the URLs from email. So now you actually come up with a regular expression, which actually is a, which matches a URL string. And once you have it, you can actually put it in a particular event and then you can say, okay, I want to match this regular expression, anything which matches, I want to store it in a variable and now I have a extracted URL. Similarly, like, okay, what if that URL only has an IP address instead of a domain name? So you can actually go further match with this regular expression and you have it. So these are the, like, this is how, 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 Okay, how is it now, clear? Yes. Okay, so uh, let's start again. Uh, sorry about this, I have no idea what happened. Generally, Zoom works quite, quite well but uh, it's fine. Uh, so let's, let's keep going on. Uh, so the pattern actually has like, well, from two, six onwards, uh, it has like new features like case insensitivities, and then there is this uh, different operators. So because the problem used to be like, okay, if I have to match a word password, now you have to worry about like uppercase, lowercase, and also keep, keep in mind that you need to uh, uh, like uh, use like a slash i for that purpose and so on and so forth. But let's let's go into a little more interesting stuff. So there are container types like there is set, table, vectors, and then there are records which actually create allows you to create new data structures. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, just let me know or interrupt me. Uh, 
uh, I, I'm just, just, just going to keep going otherwise. So, uh, like, here is the example of set. So, some of the set uh, which I actually end up using is like never drop nets. And these are networks which we don't want to drop. So, you just like put those inside, and then you're pretty okay uh, at the very end where you are actually calling a drop, like in notice uh, uh, drop action. You can actually say if the uh, end dollar source is in never drop next, return, don't do anything. Then I use it for like live nets, uh, identifying dark nets, defining things like what are our scan networks and so on and so forth. You can even go further like, okay, here are the subnets which are primarily used by Nigerian scammers and see if you are getting an email from those subnets too. Then uh, like ignore this block, uh, port. Uh, if you have a list of block ports on border, that can become a set, your name servers, uh, mail servers. Uh, if you have a watch list, like okay, that can become a set and so on and so forth. So the deal with set is like, okay, so the way you define that is you say a set is a set of an address. You can have a set of address, strings, uh, uh, ports, subnets, like any of the data types can be a container set. And then you can uh, put values in there. Uh, the deal and the way it runs is like, if this IP is in a set, yes, it is in a set. Uh, the problem with set is that uh, set doesn't have an order preservation. So if you have an expectation of that, uh, it's not gonna work. What works is that set is a good membership test. Uh, but uh, like if you run this code multiple times, you will see that yeah, it doesn't preserve any order. So uh, uh, where does this matter? For example, here is an email, and then the mail actually. Uh, 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 let me give you a better example. So at one point, I was tracking user hops. So like a user A logged in from machine one to machine two, and then from machine two to machine three, and then three to four. And uh, so you start tracking those hops. And if you put that in a set, uh, like it's a really wrong data to have because you won't know like which was first machine and uh, where to where they went to. So for that, uh, you end up actually using vectors. So that gives you a order of preservation. So then now you can really know that, yeah, it went from machine one to two to three and so on and so forth. But uh, that's the, Thing. So you can use set, you can use vector. Uh, oh yeah, so one of the uses for set I have is uh, like, okay, when you do a membership test, not only that, but you can also do a size of the set. So, and this helps in a bunch of things. For example, like does this IP uh, touch more than N number of hosts, for example, five number of unique hosts. So you can actually put those in the set and see if, uh, uh, the size of the set is greater than equals to five, then you can take another action, call it in scanner or something like that. So you can actually uh, not only test the membership, but also size of the set. And it's pretty handy at various place uh, and various times. So uh, now again, again uh, so I was thinking is like, okay, when you write Zeek scripts, how, like what do you do? So I, I went and I did a simple Google search and it's like, okay, if you do a Zeek scripting, so the very first hit itself takes you to a good uh, uh, length, which is the manual I talked about in the beginning. And there is a whole lot of architecture there. So uh, now uh, comes uh, the another data structure is stable. And uh, actually, can I minimize it? Yeah, so another data structure is stable. And uh, so like there is sets which I heavily use and then there is a table. So what I started doing is basically, okay, let's, have a problem and then translate that particular security problem into code. So basically the idea was like, okay, I would like to track how many connections does a single IP make. So this particular question now translates into like, okay, uh, I have a table of uh, addresses of count. Uh, so table of type address of count. And this would actually get you like, okay, a particular IP and then how many connections is it making? And then you can actually go Further, and you can start defining certain characteristics to the table. For example, there's an expiry, create expire. So what this would do is that uh, it gives you a capability in the table to automatically expire something which has been created uh, uh, with a timer. So like uh, when I say one day, basically 
uh, that particular address is going to expire after uh, 24 hours of creation. And then once it expires, you can even further append things like, okay, uh, I have an expire function. So when this particular entry expires, it would actually fire up this function and that function can actually do a bunch of things. So like for in this particular case, I said, okay, I'm going to uh, keep a track of how many connections this particular IP makes and then put that in the table. When I call the expire function, I have a notice called scan summary. And then it can say like 1.1.1.1 made 2700 connections or 2700 connections depending. And then like once you define this, you can actually tap into different events. So like for example, new connection or other events and uh, uh, and then basically uh, use that event to populate uh, a particular table or uh, even remove the entries out of it. So. Uh, so another thing is like, okay, how many times two particular hosts talked with each other in last one hour? And now that's a pretty interesting security question too. And that becomes another table too. Like, okay, here is a table uh, where there's a source address, a destination address of counts. And then you again say a create expire of one hour. And this way, like uh, if you tap into like, let's say even connection attempt or a new connection or a connection established, depending on like what kind of flavor do you want uh, uh, when you say that how many times hosts have talked to each other, like is just sending a simple spin or talking or do you want a fully established connection uh, with a full asset? So depending on that, you can tap into like a new connection or connection your attempt connection established and then just populate the table. So this, this is how generally uh, the security questions translate into code. I think I have a few examples too. So like, okay, can you build a list of all the services for all the hosts on the network? And by this, I mean, like uh, know your network, right? So uh, you have all uh, so many machines, there are uh, client systems, there are servers. Now, can you build a list on fly for all the systems which are actually hosting a particular uh, a given service? So yes, sure, we can tap into an event called connection established, which actually would trigger when there is a uh, full TCP handshake done. And then uh, I actually created this table called host profiles, which is a, a table of address of set ports. Uh, <laughs> just read expire of one day. So what this does it, let's say you have a mail server and uh, an external IP comes and connects to your mail server on 25 TCP. So your, uh, the table will have an entry of mail server and set 25. Now mail server also runs a web server. Uh, bad idea, but it does. So now somebody connects to the web server. So the same address will actually now have set of 25 and 80. Now it runs SSH 25, 18, 22. So this way, uh, once you start actually adding to the host profile uh -huh, based on connection established event, soon you should have list of all the services which are not only listening, but had established connection from uh, uh, different hosts. And so this is how you actually end up using table, but uh, an example of how a particular security thinking works inside the scripting land. So, uh, same thing, can we track a recent exploit uh, attempt uh, uh, on a given host? Sure, just create recent exploit attempt table address of that attempt. So, uh, so you can get pretty creative actually. So table is a very powerful functionality. If you go to this particular URL again, you will see a whole lot of literature on table. Uh, actually, what I really like on tables is also this uh, capability that you can actually do create expire, you can do a read expire, you can do a write expire. And I just saw, I, I had no idea about this, that there was an on change functionality too, where you can actually say ampersand on change. So if the value changes in the table, then it kicks on an event as well. So you can have these expire functions based on uh, these particular parameters. Uh, so, so this gets a very good, uh, uh, and what this also does, like these expire functions also, helps you with uh, good housekeeping. So like, okay, you create a table without any expiration, then you have it running as long as ZQ is running. But if you have an expire function, you can say, you know what, uh, my table is gonna handle 20,000 entries, 50,000 entries, 10 entries, 1 million entries, but there is a, 
uh, end of date on it. So, and then, but let's say some uh, you have a write expire. Then if something gets written to the table again and again, things keep getting updated. The expiration keeps increasing too. So it's not that uh, there is a hardcore uh, deadline on it. It is a variable deadline and it actually is very useful. So you only keep the things which are needed or actually being uh, used inside Z this way. So now let's get to record. So like uh, again, same idea. Uh, come up with a problem and then let's see how Zeek scripting works for you. So I wanted to track list. So I had lists of all these blacklisted IP addresses. So I wanted to know like, okay, what particular IP address was uh, like first seen? When was it last seen? How long has it been seen for? When was it last active? And then how many hosts did it make connections to and how many total connections did it make? So, and this actually is an interesting report because like this way you can actually go and uh, see like is your blacklist actually be useful or like you have 100,000 IPs in your blacklist and like nothing is touching you. There's no point burning ACLs on things which are not even coming to you or like, okay, what are the IPs which are coming more often? Like why is this IP coming uh, like for last 200 days when it's blacklisted? So you can do all kinds of questions and uh, data analysis here. And this is, uh, this can be easily done if you have a, your own data type or record. Uh, so how does this particular thing work? So like in this particular case, I created this record called connection stats, and then it had a start time, it had an end time, it has an host. Now I will delve into opaque of cardinality in a little bit, and then it had connection accounts. So this is my type definition. And then basically, uh, if the source is uh, not in connection table, initialize the table contents uh, and uh, uh, sets inside, and then basically start just populating them. So it's a pretty straightforward logic and heuristic. Now, uh, this cardinality actually is a probabilistic data structure. What it allows you to do is that if I actually say like a host is a set of uh, addresses and somehow a remote IP address now connects with, we have two class B's, so it connects with each IP address in our both class B's. So you have 132,000 IP addresses in this particular set. And think about having a million IPs in your blacklist and even 5% of them actually uh, touch all the, both the class B's. You have a very inflated table. But what opaque of cardinality allows you is that it gets you this probabilistic data structure, which gets more accurate if you have more elements into it. So if you have like three or four, it might not be as accurate. It might be three or four. But if you have like 60,670, uh, uh, it would actually be pretty close to 60,670. But uh, this allows you is that you can compress all these entries into this probabilistic data structure, which is like a bit uh, table, I believe, inside. I, I have no idea how uh, it's implemented. I think Johanna and uh, others implemented it. But this really allows you to compress a lot of things from set and still get the right value. So, so this lets me get actually numbers of how many hosts it connected to and, uh, and then connection count is literally a count. So how many times this particular connection happened. So, and now here is a slightly more complex record example. So this example was actually, uh, again, a problem I had to solve. So what was happening is uh, I want to catch fish. I do not want to uh, catch spam. And I do not want to catch uh, stuff which Google and Iron Ports already uh, have caught. So how do I go about doing that in my mail system? Because I don't want to generate an alert for an email which was quarantined by Google or Iron Ports. Uh, I, but I want to generate an email for an email, uh, generate an alert for an email which Google missed, Iron Ports missed, and still is malicious. Uh, so how do I go about doing that? So I created this SMTP record. I had a timestamp. Then this is the message identifier string. If you go and look in SMTP.log, you should see this. And uh, then uh, I created this type called ham or spam, basically a Boolean. Uh, actually, there was no spam there. I, I think this is a, uh, 
and then I had uh, what was the antivirus verdict? So what is the AV verdict? And generally, the like Google will have an AV verdict. Iron Force has an AV verdict. And then there is the delivery. Like what was the delivery status? Is this quarantined? Is it delivered? Is it actually tagged as spam and blocked? Dropped? So what is the delivery status? And then who is the mail from and to and all the subject? And if there is an attachment uh, or multiple attachments in there. So so this was what I created and. What this does is like if you look at the central mail log, you should see like here is the message digest. Here is an email coming. Oh, man. A mail coming from support at dhl.com to somebody and then it was flagged as spam positive and then it has a malware in it and it was a top. So I do not care about this message at all. And so what I did is like I would take the siren port log, use input framework, put it inside Z and then uh, use this record against smtp.log and then generate this entry that okay here is this message the id this iron port says that it is a spam uh, it's a viral thing and there is a uh, delivery status and here is mail from into so this way i can eliminate a lot of false positive and just worry about the things which are missed by google and iron ports does it make sense so now uh, in this particular record, uh, uh, like uh, there are certain complexities I haven't really got into. So, like, how do you inject iron port logs? So, the way you inject iron port logs is you use an input framework, and then you should use the iron port log as a stream, and then you have to parse logs a little bit. And then, what about the latencies of the logs? So, like, like the e email comes real time. So, email comes faster than like your logs. And the log is like, okay, iron port generates the log, the log goes to the central syslog server, then from there it actually comes to the cyber syslog server, then it actually gets fed using input framework inside Z, and then you have the data. So there's definitely milliseconds of latency, if not seconds. So what I end up doing is I put things like emails in the table, and then I use the create expire with expiration functions of like 30 seconds. Uh, until I get entries from the input framework and then you basically take action based on the table expiration using expire function I've talked about. So that's how you would end up uh, doing things in a little complex manner, but uh, highly effective actually and kind of addresses the latencies uh, uh, which surprise you sometimes. Now Bloom filter is one of the favorite data structures I have too and what this allows you is that it's a basically uh, bit array. So now, uh, what it literally does is like, okay, here are the probability. Uh, I want to put 100 million things in Bloom filter uh, with a probability of one in uh, like three, three, six, eight. So, like with this particular probability, I want uh, uh, to generate a false positive, and then you can add something to Bloom filter, and then you can do a test. Now, where does this work? Uh, so this really worked well in the SMTP URL heuristics, uh, where I would actually extract all the URLs from email, put them in a Bloom filter, and then uh, in HTTP uh, uh, traffic, I would uh, I would actually check against the Bloom filter in uh, in the HTTP. And uh, so I don't have to record all these URLs. I can just have a Bloom filter, check all the HTTP GET requests against it, and I I know if a particular uh, URL in an email actually has a match in HTTP. So uh, now, uh, and same way I have used Bloom filters in blacklist. When you have like 10 million blacklisted IP addresses, Bloom filter works really well rather than putting things in sets and tables. And then, uh, so here was one problem one day, one time I had this issue. Uh, so I wanted to reduce the rate of false positives. So I said, you know, uh, if uh, we have, uh, uh, if we uh, can track all the outgoing IP addresses. So for example, like, uh, you know, here is this particular remote IP to which an internal LBL IP has made a connect, initiated a connection to. So if I am initiating a connection to something outside, very likely I know what I'm doing, where I'm going. Of course, there's like malware backdoors and all those things. But can I keep track of it? So sure, let's use a Bloom filter. Let's see like, okay, if I can keep track of all the 
fully established connections coming going from the lab to outside. And based on that, if the remote IP is flagged as a scanner, I check against the Bloom filter, and then I take more actions. Like why is the IP to which I made a uh, I initiated a connection is being flagged as a scanner. Is it actually a malware callback backdoor IP or is it a false positive? And then that way you can actually uh, improve your detection heuristics too. And now there is actually a cuckoo filter as well. And Jan actually, I think wrote this thing and it's a really good. So I put a link to the talk and uh, yeah, it, this is something you should definitely explore as well. Uh, so now going back to opaque of cardinal IP, uh, the reason I put this slide here is because uh, I actually had a hard time even uh, putting this declaration. And I, I believe it was Jan or Johanna who actually sent me this thing. Uh, basically, like how do you even uh, create a table uh, with index of address of opaque of cardinal IP, and then you actually use this particular function uh -huh, to actually initialize this thing. And I have used this particular uh, uh, data structure inside scan detection. So you can actually create this table of all the distinct peers. So a particular uh, remote IP, how many uh, uh, destination IPs it connects to? And if, let's say, it connects to 60,000, 100,000 IP addresses, you actually can just put that here. And I think in one of the other talks, I had a uh, graph for all the memory consumptions like if you have a set of 100,000 elements in a table which has uh, 10,000 or 20,000 entries, how much memory is burned versus if you have a table with same number of elements but opaque of cardinality and the memory is like two orders of magnitude difference. But this thing works awesome. Like you create this thing. It's a pretty, uh, you know, those who understand a simple description like declaration, but those who don't is a wacky thing. But ultimately, once you are done here at this part, you literally come here and then you say, if the source is in known scanners, it's not in known scanners. I actually uh, look at this. Uh, I do a cardinality ex uh, estimate, like ho how many total elements are in there. And then basically, if it meets the threshold, I go and I process that as a scan. So this works. Quite a uh, quite a lot actually. Like uh, uh, so, one time I had a problem. Like I said, okay, like uh, can I actually uh, do measurements where all the workers are actually monitoring the connections and then sending the summary data to manager, and that way I can keep track of how many uh, like IPs a particular scanner has been hitting over next 30 days. So I actually said, okay, a host is an opaque of cardinality. And then uh, whenever a new connection happens, I actually go and populate it. And then I send it to manager and I just say cardinality merge. And then I actually merge all the uh, data which uh, workers are sending to manager. And this still gets me a very accurate uh, host counts uh, across the board with a highly efficient memory usage too. Uh, so now uh, the question comes down to is like, how do I even start scripting in Zeek? So I, as I told you, like, okay, go, uh, go to try.zeek.org, really good place. I, I can't recommend this enough. Or you can actually like set Zeek paths and then something like this. Uh, and then you can run uh, Zeek on your local machines on PCAPs you have. So. Uh, uh, this is best way and like try it out. If you stumble, have problems, just ask on Slack or even directly message me. I'll be more than happy. I I still haven't forgotten my uh, early days where uh, uh, I won't even know like uh, who to go and ask uh, if it were not for Scott, Robin, and Jim Lander. So it was hard and they helped me quite a bit. So I'm happy to help back. So like, okay, uh, now how does the structure of Zeek scripts work? Like, how do you think about it? So you have to identify the events where you want to tap into. For example, if you want to extract all the URLs from the email, then you have to tap into SMTP related events. If you are, are, want to do something uh, uh, with, uh, let's say NTP, then you have to go and tap into NTP. So the way I end up doing is I actually grab on string event in uh, Zeek uh, base 
uh, or weak uh, policies and then see like what all particular events are actually even provided to me by a particular uh, uh, analyzer of Zeek. So in HTTP, I can go into like base protocols, HTTP, and then grab on a string event. And there I could see all that. Of course, you can go to the literature and do it too, but a lot of grab through Zeek distribution code, especially in the policy land, uh, gets you a pretty decent idea. So the advantage is there is like you not only actually find like what all events are provided to you, but you can go and look into those scripts and see how those events are actually used. And that's a pretty good learning experience too. And then you have to identify appropriate data structure, like is table a good thing? Is set a good thing? Should I have a table of sets? Should I have a table of bloom filter? Like you have to figure out like what is efficient in terms of memory, uh, volume, scale, uh, expiration, uh, that you should define scopes as well. What particular notice types are you going to be using? Is clusterization needed? Almost always cluster answer is yes. And then uh, the, the scaling really haunts me at times too, where it's like, okay, I didn't think I'm going to be working with like 40 million uh, elements now. And now, okay, I have to figure something out here. So, so here is, uh, 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 I think, uh, when I gave this talk last time, I, I mean, this was the only slide which people actually liked in the talk because most of the people came and talked about this. So here is this problem. I want to track all the HTTP traffic, which actually generates a 404, which basically means uh, not found. So like some remote IP comes in and does a lot of HTTP 404 on my local web server. Now that actually is an example of like a web crawler, a spider, a scan like that. So how do I track it? So it's a pretty simple heuristic. Like this, the problem is I want to track HTTP not found on our web server from a remote IP address. So, okay, how do you do it? You say, okay, table address of counts, and then you track how many counts of 404. And I just, I, I, no reasoning. I just arbitrarily took a right expire of six hours. Just because I think that time I wasn't even sure what volumes I'm going to see, what the scope and the scale of it. And then I went and I tabbed into event, HTTP reply, pretty standard thing. And, uh, and the priority actually defines where, like, so you have multiple declarations of HTTP reply. So where this particular uh, event is going to trigger in the sequence of all the HTTP reply triggers. So a lower priority better for your custom code. Uh, that way, like most of the data structures are filled and everything is under control too. So then I said, okay, I'm going to have a origin IP address. I have a response IP address. Uh, and that comes from like CID, origin and response edge. And then the code actually in HTTP reply gives me uh, 404. So if the code is 404, then look if origin uh, IP is in the table. If it's not in the table, then initialize it. And if it's in the table, just increment it. And then uh, using the pipes here, you see them do a count test and you see how many, uh, what's the count on origin. And then if the count is 100, generate a notice. And so it's a pretty simple thing, pretty effective too, in sense like, okay, now I am able to find the web spider or something which is scanning on HTTP. Uh, a very simplified version though, but yeah. So here's this code and this, this, this should work. The problem is everything I told you is actually wrong when you look at this from the Zeek scripting point of view. So like, okay, so the error is little up, but this is wrong, this is wrong. In fact, this is wrong, this is wrong. So everything in this code is wrong. And actually it's not wrong. The code would still work. It's wrong in the sense that when I send this script to uh, Seth, Robin, Johanna, like the de developers, John, Justin, they're going to just throw it away. Uh, and here's why things are wrong. So like this is a better word rewrite version. So you like look at the entire code. There is no need for response. IP. So, so you shouldn't actually even declare that. Like, why would you even have, even though it's a local variable in local scope, uses like what, four bytes, maybe eight, uh, 
no point declaring it so uh, so so that's gone the second thing is you should always check for membership like this code here uh, just runs for everything like you have an http reply going for a local web server you have an http reply for a remote web server as well so this code would run for everything so what you end up doing is you say like is the source in uh, local net if yes like i don't care about outgoing i only care about incoming so just return and this should actually reduce a lot of processing for you already now if the code is not 404 just return so like not necessarily all the http codes are 404 like a vast majority of them i would love to say is 200 okay so just return there and then actually you come here and you say uh, like in this thing remember i said okay one uh, and then once you have it like uh, when you are initializing the table it's one and then you go and now there is off by one error your answer is always going to be one more than what's supposed to be so the logic flaw and i think this is one of the most elementary alerts people make like off by one so what you do is like oh no 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 this should be zero even though i have de defined default as zero and then you go and you increment and always plus equal remember don't do an equals and then also on so this is this is the way uh, well, so the main point here actually do i have a slide yes so the main point here is actually eliminate all the uninteresting connections from your script if something is not interesting say return and if something is interesting then only you process it if it's a local net you return uh, so now there like uh, i'm just uh, i see that i only have like four three four minutes more so i'm just gonna go a little fast on this uh, just a second let me ask people should i go fast or should i just like stop for questions I would I would stop for questions here, Ashish, because we have to stop at three because we have to host something else directly afterwards. Right. Yeah, okay. So any questions? Uh, yes, I think there is a full length recording for the talk I gave in 2018 uh, and uh, I believe uh, uh, Brocon or Zcon. Uh, so there is a full length talk for this uh, recording, but uh, Ashish, I'll get the <laughs> link and share it when uh, I share the recording of this. Okay. And, and at the same time, uh, just feel free to reach out to me and uh, I can actually give you more information or answer the questions too. Uh, my, here is my info. And I, I, I have a quick question before uh, we hang up. Uh, so this was uh, like a very elementary thing, uh, like uh, for uh, like pretty new people who come into Zeek scripting world. But uh, there is a lot of uh, like topics like improved framework, uh, uh, Postgres database uh, linking with Zeek and all those things. If people are interested, if there is enough interest, I, I can make another talk for that material as well and uh, include like remaining portions of this talk in there. So just let Amber know that too. Uh, topics like clusterization, how do you write uh, uh, things in clusters? How do you use input framework? How do you use uh, uh, like Config framework, Intel framework, there is a whole lot of things in there. Any other questions? Uh, this is Peter from Indiana University. Um, I'm certainly interested in config framework stuff and any other basics. I'm kind of just getting started here. So if you have talks, I will listen. Oh, okay. Good to hear, Peter. Definitely let me make some stuff and uh, uh, if not talk, I'll still send things your way. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, I think many, uh, maybe like myself, is uh, I've, I've played with Zeke scripts a bit, but this has been uh, rapid fire. So I'm still going through notes and would probably go back through these videos and uh, in order to really develop some good questions. 
So, so for those on the call, we do have on our Zeke YouTube channel now, we have a, a Zeke from Home uh, playlist where all of these uh, uh, Zeke from Home uh, episodes get added. On the blog, we also shared not only the video recording, the audio and the slides. So all this will be produced within a couple days and shared um, with everybody uh, in the community. And, and Ashish, it sounds like uh, from what we're hearing, uh, it looks like we'll be scheduling you for another talk in July. Um, so pick a Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it would be like I was thinking today morning, it would be, see, I already promised to give a training in the ZCon, which probably is not, un it's uncertain, but uh, like this material is gonna be anyways there. So sure, if people are jumping into scripting world, uh, happy to actually talk about all this stuff and most of it is actually because of, the, of all the goofy mistakes I keep making so any other questions so th thank you so much and I apologize for uh, whatever the network latency uh, issues were uh, we'll figure it out uh, but thanks a lot for listening and joining and feel free to send me any questions. Anything is good. So no question is a bad question, actually. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Ashish. That was really great. Thank you, everyone.